My name is Andy. And I'm Janelle. And we're from the Orlando campus, and we're going to be talking about big hearted generosity. I found Jesus at a very young age through my mother. Throughout life, I really struggled with having my own identity in, in Jesus. And I really believe I made my faith my own when I came to Grace Church. I was not raised in the church. I didn't really get to know Jesus until I met Andy and his parents. They were a huge influence in my life. We've been coming to Grace for about 10 years now, but it wasn't until about three years ago that I really started um, focusing on my relationship with Christ. I ended up in the hospital with, um, after just years of alcohol abuse. Um, it was at that point that I knew God wanted me to stop drinking. <sighs> it wasn't until about six months later um, I started getting in the Word every single day <laughs> and just devoting my life to being faithful and obedient to Christ and He changed my life. <laughs> I would have to say one of the critical things that's changed me is the men's leadership at Grace. Knowing that I have a group of men around me that pushes me to be a better father, be a better husband, be a better leader. There's going to be ups and downs, but knowing that I have those guys in my life praying for me that are on my side is invaluable to my spiritual growth. Pastor Mike talks about how he and Kelly are the 11th largest givers in the church, and they are not by any means the 11th richest person in the church. But I always feel challenged by the fact that he is giving generously, and if he can give generously, then I know that it's an example for me to be able to give generously as well. When Hurricane Irma came through, it shut our business down for almost a month. It was really hard financially that month, but I just felt like God saying to us that, do you trust me? And through that month, we continued giving in the manner we had, we had been giving. And that very next month, we had one of the largest months of business we had had in a very long time. And I'm not saying that that's how God always works, but in that moment, that's how we saw him work. Pastor Mike always talks about money is never about money, it's always about trust. It's part of what we do. It's part of what the Bible commands us to do is be big hearted givers. And just the, the benefits that I know my wife and I have seen in our spiritual walk has really encouraged us to challenge people just to take that next step. And so if you're not giving, you know, 10%, give five. Whatever you do, just constantly be taking that next step towards Jesus. And I challenge you into doing that. And what you'll find out of that is if you can trust God with your money, then you can also trust Him with other parts of your life as well. It's not that He wants our money. He wants our hearts. And when you trust God and start to give generously, um, God just does wonders in your heart. We were both people that were once really broken. And when we started getting in the Word every single day, the desires of our heart changed and we begin to learn about what God talked about in His Word through money and possessions and giving. Over 2,000 times it's mentioned, which means it's an important thing. But you don't know those things if you're not spending that time every day with them. And so I would encourage you, if you're not giving, spend some time in the Word, draw close to Jesus, and see what He does with your heart. is specifically designed to help you understand what is Grace Church, like why, what, what is the DNA of this church. And today we're looking at our eighth house rule, and that is big-hearted generosity, big-hearted generosity. And uh, we prioritize giving to God's work over protecting ourselves. Now, now listen, when we wrote this, it was super important for us to, uh, to kind of tease out, if you will, a great challenge that all of us have with money. And that is that our priority most of the time when it comes to our money is protecting ourselves, making sure that we are first and foremost the object of our money. And so what I want to do is I want to put an argument before you today and challenge you that in order for you to have a big heart, a big hearted generosity to give to God's mission, that's going to require you to rearrange the way that you spend. It's going to rearrange the way that you prioritize what you do with your money. Now, this is a challenging thing for us because... Um, 
We've heard things like this you, when it comes to money. Our, kind of our, our thoughts are all twisted up about money. So how many of you have heard this by a show of hands? Um, money is the root of all evil. Raise your hands. All right, okay. So that's a complete misinterpretation of what that Bible actually teaches. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 on the screen right now. I'll show you what comes close to what they're trying to say. And this is what it says. For the love, everyone say love. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils, okay? So when it says that, does that mean that money is evil, yes or no? It does not, right? In fact, here's, here's what I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue that God desires for you to be taken care of. He wants you to be provided for. He wants you to have provision. In fact, one of the names of God that is found throughout the scripture is Jehovah Jireh, God the provider. God is, by his very nature, a provider. He wants for you to be okay. I think for some of us, we prioritize ourselves, and watch this, we prioritize ourselves because we believe that we're the ones providing for ourselves. We believe we're the ones that have to protect ourselves, right? But here, the idea says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, now that means that all kinds of bad things can spring up in your life if you love money. That is, disproportionately view money, not as your servant, but you begin to serve your money, okay? So, it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith, meaning that some people, when it comes to their money, actually get so wrapped up in it, and the word crave here means intensely desire. The only thing that I crave in my life intensely is generally when I'm on a diet, Fig Newtons, right? That's it. Like, that's the thing that I crave more than anything. Here's what happens to me, though. Like, I think about them. I will dream about Fig Newtons. Like, I'll wake up like, oh, man, I want a Fig Newton so bad. But I focused on, see, this is what some of us do with money. Like we think about it, we ruminate on it, we run numbers, we do all kinds of things, we, we check stuff out, we're, we're constantly thinking about it. Why? Because now we've moved not just from using money the way that God wants it to be uh, used to loving money, and then you can go one step further and that is craving money. And the Bible says that some people have actually lost that faith that they had because why? Because somehow, someway, Jesus was supplanted in their life and money became supreme. But not only that, even if you don't do that, it says here, and some people have pierced themselves with many pangs. I don't like the phrase pangs. It doesn't really communicate in English very well. So it means sorrows, right? So some people have, because of their love of money, have actually pierced themselves. Like they've impaled themselves with many sorrows because they're chasing after money. And here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. Because we're Americans, right? And because we're Americans, because we're capitalists, right? No matter what your background is, you grew up in this system, and this is kind of what we think, right? This is what we think. We think that there is a direct correlation, direct correlation, like a line of causation between how much money we have and actually how much happiness we have, right? Which the reality of that is that we see that in real life, that that is not actually true. I traveled all throughout Africa, and one time we were in um, Rwanda, and uh, Grace actually built clean drinking water wells um, in Rwanda, for hundreds of thousands of dollars, and provided clean drinking water for tens of thousands of people in Rwanda. It was an awesome experience. We were through this village one day, and it's a beautiful village. I mean, this is the place where, if it was in America, they'd have multi-million dollar homes, right? Okay? So what, what Rwanda looks like is kind of like the terrace gardens of Vietnam come together with North Carolina. It's beautiful. It's absolutely astounding. So here I am. I'm in one of those places. We're at the bottom of this giant couple hundred foot waterfall. It's gorgeous. There's a river that kind of flows out. And at the base of that is this little village of people. We were there kind of hanging out and, and, and we met some people, kind of walked into their house. The first thing that immediately pops into your head is the massive amount of smell because like, like charcoal kind of smell when you walk in because they have a, the, the floors are clay. The um, walls are about this thick and they're, about, they're clay as well. And there's a, just an open ceiling right above the, where the fire pit is where they did all their cooking. There were no bathrooms inside or anything like that. And these people were so filled with joy. Like, I can't describe it to you. It's like something you have to experience yourself. But they were so filled with love and joy. I mean, these were not people who were sitting around thinking that they were deprived. And yet, comparatively, on the world's standards, my income, my level of standard of living compared to theirs makes me a billionaire in comparison. Now, I want you to, like, know, like we were leaving, and so this generosity that they had, this, this beautiful kind-heartedness overflowed into generosity towards us. This woman comes running up to us as we're leaving, and she hands me a basket that she wove herself, and it was beautiful, and it was just ornate. It was beautiful, and then I opened it up, and on the inside of it, there were three little eggs, 
And I just thought to myself, like, this is one of the most beautiful demonstrations of generosity that I've ever seen in my whole life. Because she was giving out of her poverty, not out of her abundance. And it was this amazing experience. But at the same time, I simultaneously, I felt tremendously guilty. We were getting ready to drive back and have this amazing dinner. We stayed at the Mill de Colinas Hotel uh, in, um, in um, the capital city. Um, and that's the, you know it as Hotel Rwanda. And, uh, and we were, we were going to have this big dinner with a bunch of friends that night. So I knew I didn't need her three eggs. And so I thought to myself, you know, I just told the, the, the translator, I said, hey, you know what? I'm not going to take these eggs. Tell her, thank you very much. Appreciate it. He goes, no, you can't do that. Like to do that would just be to like really insult her in a big way. And so I just felt like this com- combination of both like real privilege that she would do that for me and yet at the same time this kind of objective like guilt. So it kind of walked away from it. But these people, they were filled with a desire to give even though they had nothing. And it was just astounding. So there is no causal line between how much money you have and how happy you are at all. Poor, poor, poor Kate Spade. Kate Spade was an amazing person in many ways. She built a company from the ground up, and she became a massive, a massive um, name around the country. And she had multiple millions do- of, of dollars. She had some troubles in some of her in her marriage, and that ended up causing her. She ended up taking her own life. It doesn't matter how much money you have, because that's not what ultimately makes you happy. Now. I do understand that there is a degree of provision that's necessary in order for you not to feel like you're constantly worried, but that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. I'd like to talk to you about the difference, I'd like to talk to you about the difference between an abundance mindset and a scarcity mindset, an abundance mindset and a scarcity mindset, and that has nothing to do or very little to do with how much money you make. So when Kelly and I first uh, got married, uh, it was awesome. We got married uh, right out of college. We went straight from the dorms to a college park condominium on the golf course, right? It was a thousand square feet, had like a big spot tub for her, and the rent, just in case you haven't been to College Park lately, it's a little bit higher now, but the rent when we were there in 1993 was $450 a month, right? $450 a month, and I remember just shaking, like I was signing the contract, I'm like, $450 a month, so much money, you know? And uh, it wasn't 1922, it was like 1933, it it was like, you know, it was like 1993. So there I am, we're signing the contract, we're doing this whole thing, right? And I got out of college, I'd just gotten out of college, I'd just spent $100,000 in, in, uh, for college, which is stupid and don't do that if you're not in college yet because no college is worth $100,000. And uh, this was in 1993, got out of that, kind of did that whole thing, got out, worked for Florida Hospital or Advent Health in the psychiatry department, and I made $8 an hour. And uh, I was like, $8 an hour, that's not a lot of money, but we'll be able to figure it out, you know, because you're young, you're 22 years old. I'm like, yeah, we're going to figure this out, it's going to be great. So, Kelly is, doesn't have a job at all. I'm like, I really need you to get a job so we can figure this out, right? And, uh, and so, so, so she, gets, she gets a job at Harcourt Brace Textbook Publishing Company, and it was an amazing job. She was going to be a textbook editor. It was an awesome job. And she came home. She goes, you don't not believe how much money they're going to pay me. I was like, what? She goes, $24,000 a year. I was like, how are we going to spend that much money? Like, that is so much money. Like, how are we going to do that? It was incredible. But here's what happened. Like, we lived in this little college park condominium, and all we had was a mattress on the floor and a card table. And that's all we had for like three years. And it was awesome. We were happy. Like, it was great. We had an abundance mindset. We could go get Starbucks once in a while. We could have fun. We could go to a movie. We could do whatever. It was awesome. We were 22, 23 years old. We had an abundance mindset. And today, I look at that amount of money, and I'd be like, what am I going to do if we were making that now? I just want you to understand that an abundance mindset and a scarcity mindset, it has very little to do with how much money you make. One day, a guy comes to me, and he says, oh, by the way, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. One day a guy comes to me and he says, hey, he says, I am having my BMW uh, re, um, repossessed. I was like, oh. And, uh, and, and he, goes, he, go, he goes, and I'm nine months behind on my mortgage. And I was like, oh, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Tell me what's going on. And he goes, well, I just, I can't figure out how to make all the bills work. I'm like, okay, well, tell me. Like, I said, what do you do? He goes, he goes, I'm a doctor. And I go, a good one? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, <laughs> And, and he, goes, he goes, yeah, I'm a radiologist. I'm, I'm good at what I do. I'm, I, I got it. And I said, I just need to know, like, can we talk about, like, how much money do you make? He said, I make $450,000 a year. <laughs> now, listen, now, I, heard the, I heard the judgment. I heard the judgment, like, all over the room, like, oh, mm, you know? Like, like, listen, but here's the thing. Watch this. This is super important. $30,000 a year and $450,000 a year is no different. It's no different. And some of you are like, you're really bad at math, Mike, right? Because <laughs> I'd like to switch those incomes just for a year. That'd be great. But here's the reason why. He was spending $600,000 a year. 
right? And so if you're spending $600,000 a year and you make $450,000 a year, which for money, many of us seems like a lot of money, you're going, in the, you're, you're, going, you're, you're going in the red. You're going to eventually have your BMW repossessed. You're going to have your house repossessed. You're eventually going to be poor. And if you have $30,000 a year and you're strategic with that $30,000 a year, $50,000 a year, whatever it is, and you're like, we do, and I'm going to tell you a story about how my mom later on, she made, never made more than $35,000 a year on her life, and she was a single mom, and she supported us. But if you make that amount of money and you are strategic about your income, you can be just fine with an abundance mindset. And so here's the difference. What makes the difference? Has everything to do with who you think generates your income. Who you think generates your income. The Bible is really clear. God gives man, God gives woman, the ability to earn what they earn. Now you go, because some of you are skeptismos, right? You're like, all right, I hear that. That's fine. But here's the thing. I work really hard. Like I work harder than everyone else. That's why I make $450,000 a year. Like I just work really, really hard. But here's the thing. Think more deeply for a second, if you could. Just think more deeply. This is who allowed you to be able to have the drive to when everyone else stops and you keep running forward, when everyone else falters and you keep rushing ahead, who gave you that drive? Your Father in Heaven gave you that drive. Everything you have comes from Him. I mean, I look at people like Mark Cuban, and you know, he's a billionaire, tech billionaire, right? And he was at the right place at the right time, developing the right thing. What gave him the ability to see what was necessary for the next five, ten years, set him up for the rest of his life? One or two choices. And that was it. Who gave him the ability to do that? Whereas I can't do that. Or I would. Right? <laughs> but, but what gave him the ability to do that? The Father. God has given us the ability to have wisdom to be able to do what we need to do in judgment with judgments, to make wise judgments about what we have. He's also given us certain kinds of drives. You see, a poverty mindset, right, or a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset is not about how much money you have. It's who you believe actually funds you. And if you believe that your Father in heaven is really Jehovah Jireh, God the provider, then you should never fear that God will not provide for you. You should not be worried about it all the time. You should be afraid. It's sometimes people who have little who actually crave the most. So I want to uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Paul gives us a point that uh, kind of reinforces what we're talking about right now. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8. It says this in verse 6. The point is this. Like, what's the point of what we're talking about? The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, that's kind of like cryptic language because we're not, we're not, uh, we don't have an agrarian society. We're not farmers. So here's what he means. Like if you sow something into the ground, right? If you put some, a kernel of corn in the ground and you cultivate it, you fertilize it, you wait for harvest, right? Then you're going to get something back. So when he says, if you sow sparingly, then what that means is that you're going to reap sparingly. So watch this. If I sow, do a little math here, okay? Here we go. If I sow one acre of corn, I'm going to reap how many acres of corn? One, one, right? But for, but so, so Paul, he's going, listen, that's fine. That's fine. Because some people do that on intentionally. There are people who live in our world right now and they're like, I'm intentionally, I'm just intentionally going to sow a little bit because I don't need a lot, right? We call it minimalism. And there are people all over the country right now who are like, you know, there's this whole small house kind of movement that's out there right now. People are making the decision to live small. Some people are making the decision to live off the ground and those kind of things. So those are great things. But listen, and that's fine. If you sow one acre of corn, you're like, I'm going to live off of one acre of corn. That's great. Nothing wrong with that, Paul's saying. However, he's saying this. If you sow sparingly, you're just going to get a little, and you need to be satisfied with that. Because what doesn't happen is you sow one acre of corn, you're going to reap five acres. It doesn't work that way. But sometimes our mindset is, I want more than, I, I feel like I deserve more than what I have. And he's saying this, if you sow, that means you work or you sow into ministry, you sow into your business, you sow into whatever. If you sow sparingly, you're going to gain sparingly. And if you sow liberally, you're going to gain liberally. This is what he means. And then he says this, listen, here's what you've got to do when it comes to sowing and reaping. You've got to figure out what you want to do what you need to do. Verse 7 says this, each one must give, and then he's talking about giving to the church, right? 
Um, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, right? So in other words, he says, you're not supposed to give reluctantly. I mean, like when the offering comes around and you put something out and then you just take back half of it, you know, like that's reluctant, right? That's not, that's not what he said. He doesn't want you to have that kind of experience with giving. He doesn't want you to do it under compulsion either, meaning someone's forcing you to do it. You should never be forced to give. You can't be forced to give. Why are these two things important? For God loves a cheerful giver. God's desire is that you are happy in your giving. God's desire is that you are satisfied with your giving. And then he says in verse 8, he says, how am I going to be happy and satisfied? How am I going to be cheerful? God is able to make all grace abound to you. In other words, he's going to make you able to do that if you are a willing recipient, right? If you are a willing participant. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, so what, what does God want for you? He wants you to be sufficient. He wants you to be okay. He wants you to be provided for in all things at all times. And then he says, why? So that you may abound in every good work. Now, what does that mean? It means that my, I'm not going to be so hooked into my money so that, why, why? This is important. I'm not going to be so worried about providing and protecting myself that when God comes calling I just resist and say, no, 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 that's not, I'm not, I'm not ready. He wants me to be ready for every good work. He wants you to be ready for any time that he calls you and asks you to do something, and he wants you to be funded to be able to do that. Now look at verse 10, it says that to us. He who supplies seed, right? So our job is to plant the seed. Who, who provides the seed? That's God. God's going to provide for you. You need to trust that. You don't need to be worried uh, scarcity mentality is never helpful for you in your business, in your mindset, the decisions that you make. You're going to make bad decisions based off of scar scarcity, which is all about fear. Instead, we need to have an abundance mindset. He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, that's an important thing for us to make a theological distinction for. He says, if you give... It's going to increase your heart, your ability, right? It's going to increase your righteousness, your ability to connect with God. But it doesn't say this, and this is where I want to like detach a teaching that's in the church today that's really false, all right? And it's called the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity, you'll hear people call it, straight up call it prosperity. What do you believe in? I believe in the prosperity gospel, right? The prosperity gospel basically believes the false premise that I talked about before, more you have, the happier you are. Even though we can see in society over and over and over again that rich people are not the happiest people and poor people are not the saddest people. We've seen it over and over again. But they basically say this, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to be rich. You know, God wants you to be provided for. He didn't say Jehovah BMW. You know, he, if, you, if you leave here in a BMW, don't be ashamed because that's what God has provided for you. And that's a blessing. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. Nothing. All right, now listen, this is important. But here's the thing. The prosperity gospel basically teaches this. If you give $1,000 to the church, God will bring that $1,000 back and he'll give you two or five or $10,000. If that were true, every person in America would be in church, right? Every person would be donating to church. Why? Because it'd be the best investment club in the history of mankind. Now, I need you to understand this. This is really like, I don't know why this is not common sense to Christians, because the Christians follow along like sheep on this whole thing. Like, like, like guys, listen, if you give $1,000 to the church, right? Watch this. If you give $1,000 to the church, you're down a thousand dollars, okay? You get that, right? Like, like that's just math. You know, this is not the Bible. This is math. Like that. That's how that works. But here's what happens: we see people, and, and this is this is why people get confused with it sometimes. Here's why. Here's why. Because when you trust the Lord with your money, He finds you faithful, and he or she who is faithful with little will be given more. It's just like anything else in your life. When you are faithful in your responsibilities at work, someone comes along and goes, hey, she's good at what she does. Let's, let's promote her. Let's lift her up. God is acting exactly the same way, or we act like him in this way. Because he's saying, listen, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some stuff, and then I'm going to test you with it. Are you going to hold on to it? Watch, look at what it says here. It says here, um, you will be enriched in every way and be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Um, I've decided to do this. You know, I, now, Andy mentioned that I'm the 11th, Kelly and I are the 11th biggest givers in the church. We are 11th biggest givers in the church. I love that. I love to give. 
And I don't know why, but the more I give, the more wealthy I feel. I feel like I'm solid, like I'm good. Why? Because I have so much to give away. I don't need to be craving money all the time to feel like I'm okay. In fact, I made this commitment to God. I don't do this with people who stand on the side of the road because I never carry cash with me. Who carries cash anymore? Anybody? Okay, all right. Okay, one guy in the back. Um, so Rob, that guy on the way out. Uh, so, but, so, any, so, but, so anyway, so like, I just want you to think about it, though. Like, I don't do that with, any, with, with, with people on the side of the road or anything like that, but I made a commitment. I said, God, when I show up to the service station and somebody asks me for something, because it happens all the time, I'm just going to give them whatever they ask for, right? So the other day, I was at the corner of... Orange Avenue, I believe, and 50. There's a 7-Eleven right there on that corner. And I was sitting up there, and this guy comes up. I'm like, all right, Lord, here it is. But I pray, God, I'm like, I need you to bring me the people that you want me to give to, period, because I'm just going to give to whoever. Like, whoever asked me. I'm just, so if you're out there, you see me at the service station, I'll just give you whatever you want, right? Don't abuse me like that, though, okay? Come on, that's not, that's not cool. But so, so this guy, he's coming up. I can see him. You know, he's kind of on a hoodie, you know? He goes, hey, he, you got to smoke? I'm like, I don't smoke, man. And uh, he goes, he goes uh, could I get a pack of cigarettes from you? And I said, yeah. I said, so I went in there, and I bought him two packs of cigarettes. And some of you guys will judge me for that. You bought him two packs of cigarettes. What about skin cancer? What about lung cancer? You know, here's the thing. Maybe Jesus is going to use lung cancer to change that guy's life. I don't know. But all I said was, I'm available, Lord. Like, I'm just going to be, re- whenever you need whatever I have, just bring it and ask and have them ask me. And we'll do this, right? The other day, it kind of backfired on me. I was at I was at a gas station on, on um, Maitland, uh, Maitland, Maitland Boulevard. Maitland Boulevard? Maitland Avenue. Avenue. And, uh, and so I'm on this gas ga- Were you there? I don't know. So, <laughs> so, so I'm at this gas station, and this guy comes up, and he goes, hey, man, I'm hungry. And I'm like, we'll go in there and get whatever you need to get, and uh, I'll come in. <laughs> and I went in, and he's got a bag. And he's like, <laughs> he's just throwing stuff in there. And, and it, was, it, was like, it was like 90-something bucks or something like that. I was like, do you know how much money 90, 90 bucks is in a service station? Everything's 14 cents in there. So he's like throwing it all. He got on a big bike and went away like Santa. It was awesome. It was great. But I told the Lord, I'm like, listen, whatever, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to, why? Because here's the thing. I believe God has blessed us to be a blessing to other people. Look, look at this, this house rule. Big-hearted generosity means we're going to prioritize giving to God's work over protecting ourselves. If my statement to God is, I'm going to hoard all my cash, that statement is, God, I don't trust you. And I want to trust him in every area of my life. So I'm going to give you two test cases real quick. One is the Corinthian church, and one is the Macedonian church. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 1 through 14. All right? Um, or at least as far as we can get. All right, um, so two test cases. Um, the first is the Macedonian church. The Macedonian church is the north of Greece. Macedonia is in the north of Greece. And Corinth, who uh, Paul is writing to right now, is in the south of Greece. Um, Macedonia was named after a guy named Philip of Macedonia. He was a conqueror. He was a warlord, basically. He kind of came in and he conquered a bunch of land, and he kind of established the nation of Greece in that way. Um, and then he renamed the city Macedonia, Philip of Macedonia, right? Okay, so he has a son, and his son's name is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is a powerful guy, and by the age of something, I don't have the exact number, like 26, 27, he had conquered most of the known world. It was amazing what he did. But because he wanted to honor his father, he took all the wealth that he, that he took from each one of these nations, and he brought it all the way back to Macedonia. Then we brought all this wealth back to Macedonia. He placed it there kind of in honor and tribute to his father and his own glory. When, when uh, Alexander the Great dies, um, what happens is uh, Rome comes in and conquers the area and takes all the wealth of Macedonia and is so brutal and so harsh to them that they basically leave them in abject poverty. So Paul has preached to the Macedonian church. These people become converts to Christianity. They're in massive, abject poverty. And listen to what he does right here. He's writing to the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church, they're wealthy. They've got a lot. And he's saying, hey, you guys, we're trying to raise some money for some Christians in Jerusalem. And these Christians in Jerusalem, are, they can't feed themselves right now. There's persecution in Jerusalem. They can't work anymore. They need help. And so he's going around all over the place, just raising money from Christians all over um, the, the Mediterranean. And surprise, surprise, Paul doesn't reach out to the Macedonians. Why? They're just so poor. They're just like the people in Jerusalem. They have nothing. And so he's not going to go to the poor and ask for help. This is what what happens. 
In verse 1, it says this. He's writing to the Corinthians about the Macedonians. We want you guys, you, you brothers, to know about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. The Macedonian churches in the Bible are things like Philipp, uh, Philippi, the Philippians, right? Um, the Thessalonians, uh, the Bereans. And so he says, we want you to know what God's been doing among these churches for in a severe test of affliction. The severe test of affliction is what I just described. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. How do those phrases even come together? Extreme poverty, abundance of joy. That comes by being rooted not in having a lot of stuff, but in having Jesus. Because when you are rooted in Jesus, when you are not moved around by your circumstances, you can have an abundance of joy in extreme circumstances. And then he says this, they've overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Somehow, the Macedonian church, they heard about the distress. They send this guy Titus to Paul and say, hey, we want you to take all this money. And they came up with a lot of money somehow out of all of their joy, out of all their poverty. And he says this, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. So what they did was they gave everything that they could for the amount of money that they had. And then they went one or two steps further. Why? We'll talk about that at the very end of the message. But King Solomon in 1 Chronicles 29, 14, he basically talks about something very similar to this. And this is what's happening at this point in time in the Bible. Solomon is King David's son. He's king of Israel. He's been tasked with rebuilding the temple in the Old Testament of God. And, and therefore, he's asked people from all over his nation to bring wealth to the city so they can build this temple for God. And he says, who am I? I love how he starts like that. Who are you? You're the king. I mean, it'd be fine if someone like me were to say, who am I? But, but he says, who am I? Why? Because he's humble before the Lord. Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything, Father, everything comes from you. And we've given you only what comes from your hand. You see, massive generosity, big-hearted generosity comes first and foremost because we know everything comes from our Father. And we don't need to hold on to it because, watch this, this is why it's not scarcity. Scarcity says, you better hold on to it because nothing else is coming. But what would it be like, though, if you knew that I was just going to give $1,000, right, and God was going to provide for you on the back end of that? You wouldn't be afraid anymore. Why? Because I have an abundance mindset. I'm going to be okay. That doesn't mean you give a thousand, he's going to give you ten thousand dollars, because he may just give you joy instead of money. And that's what it means for us not to be prosperity gospel people, right? For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, by their own accord. Who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give so generously as this? Everything comes from you, God, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. See, big hearted generosity prioritizes giving to God's church before protecting ourselves. And this is the challenge, and we talked about it before, but this is what happens, and this is the reason why many of us don't feel like we have enough. It's called lifestyle creep. Here's our salary, here's our lifestyle. As we go on, our salary increases, but our lifestyle surpasses us, and it doesn't matter. This margin right here means how poor we are. You could have $450,000 here and be spending six hundred, dollars and you're poor. You might be driving around like on a borrowed car for a while and living in a, in, a, in a luxurious borrowed house for a little while, but the bank is coming to get it. Lifestyle creep destroys our intentionality when it comes to what we do with our money. So we are blessed not just to bless ourselves, but to be a blessing to everyone else. In fact, in verse, four, in verse 4, it says this, that the Macedonian church begged us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. I imagine this is something very similar to the egg story I just told you. Here's Paul not asking for their help, but when they bring this help and Titus brings them the money, Paul's looking at him going, uh, no. Like, these guys shouldn't be giving money right now because they have nothing. But it says they begged earnestly for the favor of taking part in relieving the saints. I believe this with all my heart, Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 and 25. It says this, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly. Can we talk about that? Can we talk about what unduly withholding means? It means when I have it, because everything's given to me by God. If I have it and, come and someone comes and says, hey, Mike, can you give me some food? And my answer is no, that is unduly holding on to what you possess because you believe it's yours. Everything you have is God's. 
The Bible tells us that, that the, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so it's not my job to hold on to stuff when someone comes and says, I need help. But I'm going to give as best as I can. And it says here that a person who gives freely, willingly, gladfully, yet gains even more. How is that possible? We see it happen over and over and over again. This is why the prosperity gospel developed in the first place. It developed because very, very often you give $1,000 and somebody gives you back that money. Or it comes back to you in some way. It's just not a law that we can count on. It's not something that we make part of our righteousness. It's not something that we say to people, hey, if you give more, God loves you more. No, 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 you give not to make God love you. You give to show that you love God. That's why we give. Verse 5, and this, not as we expected. What did they not expect? They didn't expect the Macedonians to give anything. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Look at that phrase right there. It says that in order for them to get their money right, they had to give themselves first to the Lord. I'm telling you right now, you'll walk out of this message and go, that was cool. We should work towards that one day and never do anything about it unless you first give yourself to the Lord. You got to give yourself to the Lord first. And then look what it says there. And then after they gave themselves to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. See, God will reorient your perspective based upon his perspective. In other words, God will help you love what he loves. And he loves his church first and foremost in this world, period. Like he loves the gathered people of God more than anything else in the entire world. This should be a priority for you. But it's not about how much money you have. Listen, I've been rich and poor in my life. Um, when I was young, my dad was a serial entrepreneur. He wasn't a nice guy, but he made a lot of money. He was a serial entrepreneur. My dad had a furniture company, uh, two or three furniture companies actually. Um, he did some importing diamonds through uh, South Africa and chemicals through South Africa. We almost moved to South Africa actually when I was 13 years old. Um, but he had a, we had a ton of money at one point, but when my parents divorced, uh, we immediately moved out of the big house and the country club and the whole thing. And then we went to this small little house, this small little villa. It was two bedrooms, uh, three bedrooms, uh, 1,000 square feet. Um, my mom supported us from that point on. And my mom never made more than uh, $30,000 in her whole life. And it was an amazing thing uh, to watch because she would just work really, really hard. She was uh, not, she didn't go to college. And so she, she, uh, she worked her way up from a teller uh, at a savings and loan to become the vice president of the bank. And uh, they still didn't pay her, right? Because women are never paid, right? And uh, sorry, that was political. Sorry, that was, um, that was actually personal, not, not political. So, so, but all that, all that to say that like she just, you know, she got to that point where like she was really um, just pouring it all out for my brother and I just to put food on the table. That's all she could do, right? And we never felt like we were deprived. We never walked away feeling like, man, I wish we could go back to the country club or anything like that. We watched my mom just as a single mom just labor and labor and labor. And there was joy in our family. And there was good stuff that was taking place. I want you to understand that there's no direct connection between how much you have and your happiness. Um, now, if you will, just skip down to verse 9 with me. Um, this, is what it, this is what it says, and this is where we're going to land the plane. For you know the grace of, God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You see, the very reason why we give what we give is to show the Lord that we love him, but it's also in the pattern of Christianity. When the Bible says that Jesus was rich, it didn't mean his earthly life. It meant that here's Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with God in eternity. There is joy, there is peace, there is one, there's beauty. I can't even imagine what that's like. And yet, because of our brokenness and our sinfulness, God sent Jesus into the world. And when he sent Jesus into the world, we stuck him on a stick and killed him. So here's this one who, became, who was rich and became poor, but he became poor and suffered this loss of all that he had so that you and I could have salvation and become rich in him. Don't crave the world. Don't crave what you possess. Allow those things to fall. Use them appropriately. Man, God wants you to have stuff. It's okay. We got Disney passes. We don't need them. My wife loves Disney. We go to Disney all the time. There's stuff that you just, it's great. Use that stuff, but don't protect yourself. So here's how I'm going to ask you to do it. I want you to take the Macedonian challenge with me, and this is what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home, and I want you just to have a conversation with your husband or your wife, or I want you to have, if you're single, a conversation with yourself, right? Okay? Um, and here's what I want you to, here's, here's basically what I want you to do. Just have that conversation with your spouse and say, hey, what do we need to be giving? What should we be giving? 
right? And, and, and this is where people get all like, all like technical and become accountants. And here, here's, here's what happens. Because people, people go, well, how much are we supposed to give? Well, the Bible says you're supposed to tithe. The word tithe means 10%. It means a 10% of everything that you have, right? And people go, that's so much money, 10%. Okay, hold on. So is that 10% of gross or net? Like which one, like is, which one is it? Is it the big one? Is it, obviously it's gross. But no, no I'm just kidding. There's nothing, there's, <laughs> there's nothing in the Bible that says that. So you do whatever your conscience tells you to do on that. But here's what I want you to do. Go home, have a conversation, say, where's our number? What's our number? What's our percent? Right? And don't be emotional. Don't come to a sermon and go, oh my God, he made me cry. Here's a bunch of money. You know? Don't do that. Just be intentional about it. Be intentional about it. So what I want you to do is go home and go, we're going to do this every year. We're going to give this amount of money. I'm going to give this amount of money. Or we're going to give this percentage, right? And every year, just keep doing it because this is what Kelly and I are doing. We're ratcheting up our giving every single year. Why? Because we have an abundance mindset and we know that more is coming. It's more is coming, right? And I'm not worried about it. So here's what we're going to do. You just come home, have that conversation because here's what's going to happen. One of your spouses is going to go, oh, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think we should do that. I don't think we should do that. I want you to fight with them, okay? Just like fight with them, just throw down. So, oh, you don't love Jesus. Okay, cool. You know? Um, but, but here's, no, I'm just joking. But so, so here's what I want you to do. Just do this, have that conversation, come up with that number, and then take that Macedonian check. Do, go one step further. Why one step further? I want you to be uncomfortable when you're giving. I want you to go home and go, you know what? Faith requires us to trust in God. Am I giving right now? Because here's the thing. Let's just be honest, right? There's some people in the room that for you, 10% is a joke. You should start out with 25%. Because 10% for you, you're like, oh, 10%? Cool. What's next? That didn't cause you any faith. That didn't cause you any, And for some of you, 10% is just like you're pulling out your hair. Take a step of faith. You come up with your number. Just come up with a number. And then say, what's the next step? And do it. And listen. From $8 an hour to where Kelly and I are right now, which is we're doing great, God has always provided for us. He's always watched over us. He's always taken care of us. We've never wanted for anything. We've been fed. We're good. Too fed. We're good. God will provide for you. He is Jehovah Jireh, and he loves you, and he will not leave you destitute. Amen? Let's pray. Father, it's always hard uh, for some in the room to think about their money because they do crave it and it's got a hold of them instead of them having a hold of it. Help us, God, not to serve our money, but to have our money serve us, Lord. We pray that, and we just ask God, even now as we think about it, Lord, if I were the only person in the church and everyone gave the way that I give, would the church be blessed or would it cease to exist tomorrow? I pray, God, you would put that question deep inside of our hearts because you are worthy and everything that we have comes from your hand. And Father, we want to continue to have the blessing that you've poured out on us. Bless us, God, so that we can be a blessing. Don't let it stop just with us. It's in your name that we pray, amen.